So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with every breath from my bronze pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the West. We will rise from the wind swept Northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked South. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country. Our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Friends, I am so excited to wrap up this series this week. Uh, I've really loved it, and, I, and I'm excited about this message. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew 5, uh, where we're catching Jesus is right at the beginning, close to the beginning, rather, of the, um, of the Sermon on the Mount. It, it begins in chapter 5, and basically Jesus is introducing this idea of the kingdom of God. He's talking about the, the ethics with which people are to live. He's, he's challenging some norms and notions of his day and of his time, and he's going to do a, a whole lot to lay out what it means for him to be who he is, for the ministry that he is going to do, and to define what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, Jesus. And so it begins with these Beatitudes uh, that are very familiar, but I want to read just a couple of verses, uh, verses 14 through 16, and I would invite you to hear these words. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. May God add blessing to our reading and understanding of these words. So right here, I think what Jesus is beginning to do as he shifts out of the Beatitudes and continues in this Sermon on the Mount is he's giving us a theology of discipleship. And this is going to be a part of it. And this is one small part. We're only looking at these couple of verses this week, but it's one small part that begins our understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus in, in any time and in any age. And so I want to talk about these two light metaphors that he uses. And notice that there's a shift in thinking. So first he says, you are the light of the world. Um, Eugene Boring, he's a, a, a really uh, a wonderful uh, biblical commentator. He, he sort of helps us step back and think about what that means to say that, that we're the light of the world. The primary function of light is not to be seen, but rather to allow things to be seen for what they are. Think about that. We don't turn on light to look at the light. We turn on light to be able to look at other things. It gives us the opportunity to see the way things actually are. When Jesus continues, he says, uh, we, we put a, a light on a, a lamp on a lamp stand so that it lights the whole house so that all can be seen for as it is. And this, this light, by the way, Jesus will make abundantly clear, not in what we're reading today, but, but throughout the gospel of Matthew and elsewhere, that this light is not something that exists within ourselves. We don't have it by our own power and our strength and our ingenuity, but rather by the gift of God and God's spirit within us, we have a light to share to the world. It is the light and the life of God, the very spirit of God within each one of us. And through the power of God, we're given sort of courage to name and to illuminate things for what they are. And this in and of itself can be a challenging work. Uh, we've talked about that throughout the series, the difficulty of naming things as they are in a world where power prefers homeostasis. And it's easier simply to take things as they are than to challenge them. Jesus' words ought to offer us courage in telling the truth and naming what things are. There's a second uh, metaphor that Jesus uses. It's tightly packed in these verses for this idea of light. As a city on a hill, he says, a city built on a hill cannot be hid. In other words, uh, this is about being seen. So the last one, you're the light of the world. You're to provide light so that other things can be seen. But a light on a hill, sort of like a beacon, sort of like a lighthouse, is intended specifically to be seen, to be looked at, uh, to, to enable uh, um, um, other people to see that, that it is there. 
It's a beacon, and just as everybody sees a city on a hill, so we should let our light shine before others. But Jesus is going to put some specificity on that. What does it mean to let our light shine? What does that look like? And he's going to say specifically that it's about good works. That's how we do that. Um, he's also going to define why we do this. Why do we let our light shine? Why do we do good works and let other people see it? Uh, not so that we receive salvation, not so that we get to go to heaven when we're uh, when we die, not so that, that Jesus will love us and God will accept us and, and we will be cared for. No, it's none of those things. It's not to prove that we're better than other people, uh, to, to point out or, or to, to, to clarify how, how, how righteous and self-righteous we are. It's not for any of that. He gives a very specific reason that's incredibly important. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's the pivotal moment there, to give glory to your Father in heaven. That's what this is about, letting your light shine, not so that people give adoration and acclamation to us, but instead so that they see and experience the goodness of God. We will be a city on a hill when we let our light shine before others through good works. Works. That's the task, friends, and that's a sort of introduction course to Jesus' theology of discipleship that we get in the Sermon on the Mount. I want to put it in language that we've used a little bit more recently. The, the first allusion to light is about daring to tell the truth, honest and open recognition of the way things are and having the courage to say them. How we, uh, uh, the second is more about uh, modeling what a faithful community of discipleship looks like, or in other words, how we live in beloved community with one another. Maybe we think about uh, people experiencing the kingdom of God here as in heaven, or maybe we think about that community in Acts and the way that the early Christians lived and how people began to join their ranks, not because they had a great evangelism, evangelism uh, process, but because they saw the difference in the way that they lived. So this, this idea of the city on the hill is the first reason that we come to this scripture and we find ourselves in Matthew today. But if we're honest, most of us probably aren't uh, most familiar uh, with this, this image of a city on a hill uh, from the mouth of Jesus, but rather from the mouths of politicians in America. It's been something that's been used a lot. And I want to talk about the various ways that people have understood this text and then what all that means for us. And I'm indebted this week very much to the research and the, the work of uh, Abram Van Egan. He's a, he's a, um, a professor at um, St. Louis in St. Louis. He also has a podcast called Poetry for All. And, and a lot of what I'm drawing is from that, as well as from a book he wrote called City on a Hill, which I've been very fascinated by. I've just started. But the use of this phrase, the city on a hill, um, by a U.S. president for the first time began on January 9th, 1960. It was used by President-elect John F. Kennedy at that time as he was preparing to step in his role as president. He speaks about his work of assembling a cabinet. And, and when he does, he hearkens back to this scripture as a description of who we are in the United States. That's the first time a president uses it, but it will not be the last time. In fact, it becomes used by, by almost all presidents for a while after that. Uh, no one used it more, though, and, and sort of provided more specificity or reinterpretation of it than Ronald, Ronald Reagan. To a great extent, it was his usage of the phrase built upon a particular understanding and interpretation that would cement these words of a city on a hill and America's view of itself. And I'm sure that you've heard that, that oftentimes Americans have referred to uh, America as the city on the hill. For uh, Ronald Reagan, this was filtered through a very 20th century perspective and, and the work of some historians earlier in the, the 20th century. And and for him, it was also rooted in this idea of an American exceptionalism. That was a, a pivotal concept for his entire uh, political career, beginning with his first speeches on the national stage. And it would even be the central theme of his farewell speech in 1989. He says this, I've spoken of the shining city all my political life. And his vision for it was this, a tall, proud city built on rocks, stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds, living in harmony and peace. A city with free ports eh, that hummed with commerce and creativity. And finally, he says, it's a city where doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. Now, here's what's interesting. If you listen to that, he, he, he said, the shining city. 
And it was indeed a, a misquotation of this particular scripture that Reagan would use over and over and over to describe this. So maybe it sounds more familiar as a shining city on the hill. That's not in the scriptures. It was in Ronald Reagan's perspective of it as he would use it. But I think this is so important that he makes America into this shining city on a hill. Because for Reagan, the city is already shining. It's not conditional. It's a statement of fact. It's how it is. He talked about it as an achievement. When he spoke about it, there were these undertones of chosenness and, and self-assurance at its heart. And it's this understanding that has defined much of the political use of this phrase since then. And I want to tell you why that's so interesting. Uh, because uh, uh, Kennedy and, and Reagan, when they used this, uh, and when 21st century historians used it, uh, they used it as that sort of, this is, this is a, a statement of fact. But all of them were, were alluding to one particular use of this scripture. And they were all alluding to the same one. Not to the scripture itself, but to one use of the scripture. They were referring to, to a sermon by John Winthrop in 1630. He would become the first uh, governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But the message was given to the voyagers on the uh, Arabella was the ship uh, before they boarded the boat in England on their way over here. Winthrop's message to his fellow travelers was short, uh, but you would be amazed at the number of parallels that exist between uh, the words that he gave to them and, and sort of what we've been talking about these last few weeks. Uh, for instance, he sort of cites the, the followers of Acts, the early followers of, of Jesus in Acts, excuse me, uh, is sort of pooling resources and sharing and recognizing that, that sometimes we'll have to give of ourselves uh, and of what we have for the well-being of another, encouraging people to, to live in common and to, to live with compassion. Or maybe more explicitly, he defines community that they are building in this way, that every man might have need of others, and from hence they might all be knit more nearly together in the bonds of brotherly affection. It makes me think of Amanda Gorman uh, talking about forever will be tied together victorious. Uh, finally, there's one quote that should sound familiar. Uh, he says that in order to, to avoid disaster, this is what he says, and to provide for our posterity, is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Later, he says that we must be willing to abridge ourselves of superfluities for the supply of others' necessities. I find these echoes so fascinating in what we've been talking about these last few weeks. So from there, Winthrop proceeds to come to the reason that we know of this sermon at all in the first place. All of these, these all the way through this, he's been defining the way that we do life together. And he says uh, those definitions uh, would be the settler's part of a covenant that they were entering into with God. He envisions that, that these people about to get on a boat are entering into a covenant with God and, and that they have to live in this way in order to hold up their end of the bargain. Bargain. So he says this, we have taken out a commission. The Lord hath given us leave to draw our own articles and have hereupon, we have hereupon besought his favor and his blessing. Now, if the Lord shall please to hear us and bring us in peace to the place we desire, then God hath ratified the covenant and will expect a strict performance of the articles contained in it. But if we shall neglect the observance of these articles and dissembling with our God shall fail to embrace this present world and prosecute our carnal intentions, seeking great things for ourselves and our posterity, then the Lord will surely break out in wrath against us. In essence, what he's saying is that if we don't live in this way, if we don't act as we understand disciples are intended to act, then God will not dwell with them and will, bless, uh, will not bless them with abundant power, wisdom, and goodness, and truth. Uh, it will not give them safety. It's, it's a, a conditional peace. He goes on to say this, For we must consider that we shall be as a city on a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God, and this work that we have undertaken, and so cause him with to, to withdraw his present help from us, then we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. So what I want you to hear in all of this is that Winthrop, as he's speaking to the ship full of travelers, uh, nothing about this is guaranteed. None of it is promised. None of it is assured or irrevocable or absolute. It's all dependent on the way that they live. And they're sort of entering into this covenant and even says, if we make it safely, across uh, the Atlantic Ocean, then we will be assured that God has entered into this covenant with us and we have to hold up our part of the bargain. And, and so for these settlers, like for the, the people of Israel, as we talked about a few weeks ago, their participation in this covenant would be required. 
A few more things from Winthrop. His closing uh, paragraph, he quotes Moses. Beloved, there is set before us life and death, good and evil. And he ends with this. If our hearts shall turn away so that we shall not be, so that we shall not obey, but shall be seduced and worship other gods, our pleasure and profit and serve them. It is propounded upon us this day that we surely will perish out of the good land, whither we pass over this vast sea in order to move into. If we don't do our part, we will perish. If we don't do our part, it will elicit God's wrath. For Winthrop, all of this is provisional. It's the beginning of a revocable process. And it is very possible. In fact, it is maybe even plausible or likely that their experiment would fail. And the words of Professor Van Ingen, uh, he has both hoped to create a model of Christian community and a fear that it will be an utter failure. It is incredibly conditional. So as he's speaking there on the shores to his audience in England, there seems to be this clear understanding that the, the purpose of Jesus' talk about a city on a hill is to live in certain ways. And that when we do that, we receive this blessing. And when we do that, others understand God's goodness and give glory to God. But by the time we come to the Cold War and the usage of this phrase in the, in the late 20th century, the meaning has changed. The city on a hill has become a description of what has been achieved, of something that is static, of a God-ordained present reality. Look at us, pristine and polished, perfected and shining for everyone else to look upon and, and give glory to who? Sometimes that gets lost. And so as we come to our final few minutes of this series, This Hill We Climb, uh, I want to take just a few moments to talk about the way that uh, Amanda Gorman interprets or reinterprets the hill. For, for her, the hill continues to be before us, uh, beyond us, ahead of us. And friends, that's much closer to how John Winthrop understood it when he first used this in this sermon. Uh, before us stands a covenant and the eyes of many are upon us, and it will either be a beacon or a byword to the nations, depending on how we do. But then we fast forward to the 20th century understandings that the hill has been ascended. We shine on the, the peak. God's favor and selection and preference, our exceptionalism and excellence is all plainly evident. It has been obtained. Look at the way we're shining as a city on a hill. And against that context, that predominant narrative arises in Amanda Gorman's words. She puts the hill in front of us, provisional, invitation and challenge, challenging for us. She puts it beyond us once more. We're ever moving, as she says elsewhere, forging our way forward. And her poem talks about what this looks like in countless ways, de defines this hill that we climb. Uh, we, we move towards beloved community and justice. Uh, she talks about a union with purpose, a country committed to all, seeking harmony for all. She says that even as we grieved, we grew and we hurt. As we hurt, we hoped. And as we tired, we tried that together we stepped into a past and repaired it, that we would uh, accept not the way things move, not into what was, but into what is a country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, fierce and free that we will rise. I love that illusion, uh, perhaps most especially and directly to Maya Angelou. We will rise. We will rise. We will rise. We will rise. She says this day, rise, rebuild, reconcile and recover. We will emerge battered and beautiful. That is the hill that we climb. So do you see what she's done? Part of the brilliance of Amanda Gorman's words is that, that into this context of this idea of a shining city on a hill of what we have already achieved and already been blessed with, she says, no, no, that work is still ahead of us. The hill is still something that we climb. We have yet to obtain it all. We, we continue pushing forward. She, she's demanding action, but she's not degrading the country. She's saying simply that there is still work to do. We're not shining, pristine, complete, and complacent. We're forging and working and striving and moving. So I'd like us to think back then to Matthew 5 and what we said about Jesus' vision of discipleship that we receive there. As, as we do that, I, I want to be clear that, that I don't want us to to conflate or confuse patriotism with discipleship. That's a line that too often gets blown to smithereens and has really terrible consequences. I'm, I'm not uh, conflating those as the same thing, but I will say this. There are some values like the freedom and dignity of all, uh, peace and, and, and community, so on, that, that, that are shared between the two of them. They have some commonalities. 
And so Amanda Gorman's vision for the purpose and the role of the, Amanda, of the of American people for us today and Jesus's vision for the practice of the life of the disciple, both of them share a few things in common, but one thing very particularly, it is a process. It is a calling. It's a way of being in life. It's not intellectual assent. It's not something that we've received like a status that we put on. Instead, it's about the way that we choose to live. It's not merely about values, but values in practice. The hill we climb is an ongoing process. We reach for the summit over and over again and press on towards the goal. And just like the practice of discipleship, the, the idea of moving deeper into relationship with God, it will be uh, the work of a lifetime. One of the gifts of this poem for me, and one of the reasons that I told you, I think at the beginning of this, that, that, that I haven't been able to listen to it in the first year after, I, I wasn't able to listen to it in the first year after she put it out without crying while I was listening to it. And I think one of the times is because she speaks with energy and hope and courage in the midst of a difficult and divided time, in the midst of a, of a pandemic time. And she provides hope and a call and energy and a, a vision of a better way that we could be together. And so I find that it encourages me to press on. And when I feel like I'm in a really low and difficult moment, it sort of lifts me up and says there's still work to do. In fact, every time I would get to the end of the poem, I would feel like I could just tear the walls off. Anything was possible. So as we wrap up this series, uh, there is one more reason that this scripture comes to mind this day, not only for Amanda Gorman's redefinition of what it means for America in this hill and this reinterpretation, that's a piece of it. But just as this uh, Matthew, this text from Matthew has two plays on the metaphor of light, so does uh, Gorman's poem, Begin and End with Light. If you remember back to me, with me to the opening of the poem, she starts with this question. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? Five minutes later, we get her answer. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn balloons as we free it. So one more time for those of us who sometimes don't, don't catch on to it or might miss it, for the people in the back, where do we find the light? For there is always light if we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Jesus said that, that because of his word and his spirit and his power in his followers, that we would be the light of the world. He said that a city on a hill could not be hidden, that a light shouldn't be put under a basket. In the same way, friends, let your light shine before others. Continue to press on. Let others see your good works, that they may give thanks to your Father in heaven. Amen. Let's take a few moments for reflection.